Okay, let me start with an apology. I can't speak French. I don't understand a word. I don't know what Alain just said. Other than he mentioned Donald Trump a few times, and egoist, that's about it. That's my vocabulary in French. So I apologize, and if I repeat or contradict, I hope not, but uh, anything Alain said, then uh, I apologize, and, and hopefully we'll have some time afterwards for some questions. Um, so I was asked to speak about why France needs Ayn Rand. Um, now, I don't know that I know enough specifically about France to say why France needs Ayn Rand, but I will talk about why Western civilization needs Ayn Rand, and France being, I think, a core member of what Western civilization is and from where Western civilization came, uh, I think the implication is obvious in terms of the specific context of France. I think that Ayn Rand believed, and, and, and I agree, that, that Western civilization is an incomplete project. It has not been finalized. Indeed, and indeed as a consequence, it is today in decline and in real danger in the world out there. And when I talk about Western civilization, just to be clear, I, I'm not talking about a, a race or a geography or a place. I'm talking about a set of ideas that I will get to. Right? So I think Western civilization is under threat. It has been under threat before. It seems to, to survive the threats in the past. But I'm not sure that it is up to surviving today. And this is why I think Western civilization needs Ayn Rand. I think Ayn Rand completes the project that is Western civilization, that begun during the Enlightenment, or just before the Enlightenment, really reached its, uh, its flourishing, if you will, during the Enlightenment, uh, a project that we have been living the benefits of for the last 200 years, but a project that has been under attack. The Enlightenment has been under attack, and to me, the Western civilization is the Enlightenment, under attack constantly, consistently, systematically, really since the beginning of the 19th century, the end of the 18th century. One Frenchman and one German are primarily responsible, and I'd say the two people most responsible for the attacks on the Enlightenment were Rousseau and Kant. Um, so what is the Enlightenment? What is Western civilization? What is the core of Western civilization, and ultimately what can Ayn Rand add to this, these foundational, these ideas why do we so desperately need her? Western civilization, in my view, is basically two ideas. The first being the efficacy of reason. The idea that reason is our means of knowing the world. The idea that reason is efficacious. It is, uh, it is possible to know the world through our senses and through our ability to form concepts to understand the world out there, to integrate it, and to integrate it to discover new knowledge. I think the first great thinker, in a sense, of the Enlightenment was Isaac Newton. He wasn't a philosopher, of course, but he was the first man to really, in, in a real way, show us, human beings, that we can understand the world. The material world is knowable. It is based on certain laws, and we can understand the laws. Almost everybody can understand Newton's laws. I mean, if you don't understand Newton's laws, it's because you had a bad physics teacher. They're not that hard. <coughs> and what people realized suddenly, and it took Newton a long time to explain, and to go out there into the world and say, look, people, we can get it. Things move based on certain laws, and you can model this mathematically. And look, it's doable. You can use your reason to understand the world around you. Because before that, before that, where did knowledge come from? Well, dominantly in the world, knowledge, people assume, came from revelation of one form or another. Whether religious revelation through the Pope and then maybe you know, the Protestants said, no, 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 the Pope doesn't have a unique relation to God. We all have. So each one of us had a relationship to God, and therefore each one of us could get the revealed truth. But the truth was revealed 
It wasn't known. It wasn't induced from the facts of reality. It wasn't based on reason. Or it was a platonic form, a secular form of revelation, where only the philosopher kings knew the real truth. We all live in a cave. We see shadows, if you know, you know uh, uh, Plato's uh, metaphor of the cave. We see shadows. Only the philosophers can see the light, can see real truth. Right? Newton says, in a sense, practically, no, all of us can discover truth. All of us have the tools to understand the real world. All of us can look at the sun and know the world. Now, that idea is profound. It's a resurrection. It's not a new discovery. It's an idea discovered by the Greeks. It's an Aristotelian idea. It's, in a sense, the reapplication of Aristotle to philosophy <laughs> and to our lives that happens in the early part of the 18th century. They don't always identify it as Aristotle because they think Aristotle is the church, but it is Aristotle come back. That idea is at the core of everything. Everything falls apart if you give up on reason. And I think we today, in the culture out there, have given up on reason, have abandoned reason. Today, we go on university campuses in America, and what we observe is the primacy of emotion. The primacy of revelation, in a sense. People know things because they know them. They don't need facts. They don't need the evidence. They don't need science. They just know. I, you know, I talk to, uh, you know, just to bring it to, to economics, to politics, you know, you talk to socialists all the time. And it's stunning to me. Like, 100% of the evidence in the world suggests that socialism fails always, whenever applied, and to the extent that it is applied. On the other hand, everywhere and any time capitalism is applied, in whatever dose it is applied, to whatever extent it is respected, property rights are respected, to that extent wealth is creation and people become successful and wealthy and flourish. Nobody cares. Facts don't matter. Socialism just is good. It's good, just, it, it, they somehow know it. And they don't present counterfacts. It's not like they give you a counterfact. Oh, there's this one country where socialism really worked. You know, they use Scandinavia, which is, of course, you know, uh, cheating, but because it's not socialist and it's not that successful, right? But, but, but they use Scandinavia. That's the best they can get. And, of course, when you tell them Venezuela, communism, East Europe, all that, oh, that wasn't real socialism. We haven't reached the platonic ideal yet. Facts don't matter. Reality doesn't matter. They have preconceived ideas that shape all other ideas. Emotions in America today are at the, at the primary. Again, and socialism, I think, appeals to emotion because it appeals to certain morality. It's a moral, it's a moral emotional appeal. It's not a factual, it's not a reason-based appeal. I mean, the old socialists a long time ago were advocates of reason. And, and maybe they pretended to be scientific. And partially, they didn't yet have all the evidence. We have the evidence. It's done. Right? There is no debate about socialism. There's one party that evades reality, another the party pointing at facts that nobody cares about. So we are losing the battle for reason. And we have been losing for a long time. I mean, Kant challenges reason. He's really the first philosopher to challenge it. He basically says he's saving, you know, he's saving faith from reason. That is his big mission in life. He tells us that what we see in the world is not reality, very similar to Plato, if you will, that our very fact that we have senses and we have a brain distorts what we actually see, and therefore what we're seeing is not reality, and therefore, what we reason is with just the game we're playing inside our heads. It has nothing to do with actual reality. And since then, that has just developed and evolved through multiple philosophers, whether it's Hegel, who tells us that contradictions, embrace contradictions. Contradictions are wonderful. Really? Contradictions are exactly the opposite of what we, I think you said A is A, mm -hmm. Aristotle's principle in, in, in metaphysics, that contradictions don't exist. There is no reason if you believe in contradictions. 
Reason depends on logic. Logic is the art of non-contradictory identification. It's about using your mind to, to solve contradictions, to get rid of seeming contradictions, to see what really is, where A is A. It's not B, it's not C, it's A. It can't be A and B at the same time. So, this attack on reason, uh, you know, starting from Kant and Tegel and Schopenhauer and Marx and Nietzsche and Nietzsche, it's all about the will, it's all about emotion, right? It's not about thinking. He doesn't write anything about reasoning. Uh, this attack on, on, on reason has been sustained, and today the postmoderns have no shame. I, I don't know if, I, I, you know, postmodernism is, after all, a, a French idea, uh, but it seems to have really been anchored solidly in the United States. Uh, but it is your, you know, your philosophers that, that set, it, uh, set it loose on the world. And they have no shame. They tell you. There is no such thing as truth. Well, if there's no such thing as truth, why are we even discussing? Well, we shouldn't be, right? <laughs> Just when you don't discuss, what is left? Follow orders. Do what you're told. Or do what the authority tells you. Because you don't know. Who knows what's right, wrong, what's true, what's false. So they reject the whole notion of truth. The whole notion of reality, the whole notion of objectivity, and the whole notion of reason is out the window. And all you're left with when you don't have reason is emotion. Because the fact is, I hope most of you agree with me on this, that there is no God to send us messages. And therefore, anything we hear that God says is just us projecting our emotions onto the world. At the end of the day, all there is, is either reason or emotion, nothing else. When we abandon reason, we're left with emotion. And you see that in the gangs that, that roam around campuses beating people up. <coughs> Not for anything, but just because they're angry and just because they don't like you. Right? The, the, and they're all in the name, by the way, of there's no truth. We're beating you up because there's no truth. So how dare you claim to have a truth? Now, there's an implication of this idea of reason which the Enlightenment, I think, recognized very early. Who reasons is the next question. Who can reason? Well, all of us can reason. Every human being has the capacity to reason. This is what Newton, to some extent, taught us. We can all understand the world, but we, as individuals, must understand it. There is no collective consciousness, just like there is no collective stomach so that you can eat for me. There is no collective brain where you can think for me, where you can reason for me. Only I can use my faculty of reason, just like only I can eat for me. So reason is an attribute of the individual, not of the group, not of the collective, not of the tribe, of the individual. And every individual has this faculty, has this ability. So when people started to think in the early 18th century, well, wait a minute. If I can understand the physical world, if I have reason, if I can know reality, then why can't I make choices about my life? Why can't I know what the right profession is for me? Right? We're talking about a feudal era still, right? the remnants of feudalism. Why can't I choose my own profession? Why can't I choose my own government? Why can't I choose how to live my life for me? And this is, again, the second concept on which the Enlightenment and the Western civilization rest, which is the concept of individualism. It's the idea that my life belongs to me. It's an idea that John Locke talks about when he talks about individual rights. Politically, you are autonomous and entity. The role of the state, the role of government is only to protect you as an individual. Only you can be responsible for your own life. Only you can be responsible for your own happiness. And you should be striving towards happiness. At least according to the Declaration of Independence, right? You have an inalienable right that nobody can take away from you to pursue happiness, which the founders of America understood. So there are two fundamental ideas here. Reason and individualism. The primacy of the individual which is what Western civilization is about. Without these ideas, there is no Industrial Revolution. There is no America. If you read the American Declaration of Independence, it is an ode to individualism. 
and ultimately to reason. If you read the founding document, the founding fathers, they talk about reason constantly. They are Renaissance men in a sense that they dabble in science and as flawed as the founding of America is, and it certainly is flawed because they keep the institution of slavery, it is the most magnificent political event in human history in my view. I apologize. For Your revolution wasn't quite that good. Um, because I think it was more Rousseau than it was Enlightenment. It was more, you know, uh, ultimately egalitarianism, but not in the, in the political sense, but in a broader sense than it was individualism. So these are the two ideas. Now, reason has been attacked constantly. And of course, as a consequence of that, so has individualism. Individualism don't matter. We were told during the nationalist revolutions of the 19th century, what matters is the tribe, what matters is the group, what matters is the state. And how, uh, where the borders are of this state is the most important thing in the world. And if we have to sacrifice millions of kids, individuals, in order to define and defend those particular borders rather than other borders, so be it, you don't matter anyway. And of course, individualism was massively attacked in the 20th century by communism and by fascism. The ultimate in collectivism. The ultimate in the idea that the group is what matters. And of course, the ultimate attack on reason. Individuals don't matter. Individuals don't think. Truth is revealed. It's revealed to uh, somehow to this collective consciousness, which is the proletarian, or the collective consciousness that is the Aryan race. Now, since there isn't a collective consciousness, we know that, but don't tell anybody, right? We need a leader to be able to, a philosopher king, to be able to commune with this collective consciousness to tell us what it thinks. And that's how you get authoritarianism. But authoritarians always say, I'm not doing it for me. I'm doing it for you. I'm just, I'm just discovering the truth and communicating to you. And it turns out that we have to sacrifice a huge number of people in the world in order to satisfy the will of the proletarian or the will of the Aryan race. 20 million, 100 million, 200 million, the sky's the limit when it comes to sacrificing individuals. But that is the rejection of the Enlightenment. Communism and Nazism are the rejection of the ideas of individualism and of reason. They are the rejection of the ideas of Western civilization. They are not bad parts of Western civilization. They are the enemy of Western civilization. Nazism and communism are not part of. They're the rejection of. As is the whole string of German philosophers that I mentioned. Who, of which, communism and Nazism, in my view, is the logical outcome. The necessary outcome. Collectivism always leads to destruction and death. Now, we survived, we survived the Nazis, we survived the fascists, and ultimately we survived the communists. But we're badly wounded. We've lost, well, we, we know what we reject. We reject this particular form of collectivism. And we reject murder and slaughter for the most part. What are we for? Nobody in the West today knows. We live a life, for the most part, based on reason and individualism. We love technology. We love science still. We have respect for technology and science. We try to be happy. If you go to any bookstore, I, don't, I assume in France it's the same, you have aisles of self-help book. We all want to be better. We all want to achieve happiness somehow. But we can't name it. And indeed, remnants of the anti-enlightenment mentality, both from German philosophy, but also from Christianity, are still strongly embedded in this culture. It's still true that we hold as moral, not the pursuit of happiness, not the pursuit of individual fulfillment, flourishing, of Aristotelian eudemonia, or, or, or you know, Ayn Rand, egoism, what we value still morally, what we say we value, we might not live this way, is altruism, sacrifice, giving up for other people. Other people are more important than myself. And altruism, I don't mean altruism as being nice to people and opening a door and being polite. Egoists do that. 
I'm talking about altruism as viewing the purpose of your life to serve others. Mother Teresa. That's my image. She hated her life. She did it out of duty. She did it because she believed it was moral and just. That sense, which we all have deep inside, if we grew up in, 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 in this world, that was brought to us, I think, primarily by Christianity, but also by a great French and other French philosopher, uh, Augustine Comte, who uh, encourages us to eliminate self for the sake of others. These ideas are deep inside of us, and we struggle with the ideas of the Enlightenment and these, uh, and, and these anti-Enlightenment ideas, these ideas that undercut Enlightenment thinking. <coughs> now, in my view, Ayn Rand gives us the tools to finish the Enlightenment project. I think the Enlightenment w was weakened. You could argue failed, but I don't think it failed because we're still, we still live in an enlightened world, even if it's in decline. Ayn Rand gives us the tools to fully understand and justify reason. So I think, I think that Locke and, and the rest of the, the French Enlightenment and the Scottish Enlightenment, while incredible people, and, and it created enormous value, they didn't get to the heart, uh, philosophical heart of reason. They couldn't completely articulate the case for reason. They didn't have a solid theory of concept and concept formation and how we understand the world and how we abstract and what it means to abstract and how we induce. And they didn't have a, a complete theory of inducing knowledge from reality. Ayn Rand does. At least she has the beginnings of one. She calls it introduction to objectivist epistemology because she still realized there was still a lot of work to do, but at least she gives us the tools to develop epistemology fully for full, complete defense of reason, which is what I think is the most important thing that needs to happen today, as, 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 the, as the attack on reason is again intensifying in the West. She gives us an understanding of individualism that never existed. Again, uh, because I think even the Enlightenment figures, particularly the Scottish Enlightenment, the French less so, were so imbued with Christianity that they couldn't give up on Christian morality. They couldn't give up on sacrifice as an ideal. They couldn't give up the, no, the idea that sacrifice was noble, that living for others was good, that the meek shall inherit the earth. They couldn't quite, even the, even the founding fathers, couldn't quite give all that up. You know, Thomas Jefferson uh, uh, take the, took the, the Bible, the New Testament, and cut it up, and he, and he threw away all the parts he didn't like, which is all the mysticism he didn't like. So he was a man of reason. But he kept the Sermon on the Mount, because he viewed that as a moral philosophy. That is a really, really bad moral philosophy, if you take it seriously. And it's a moral philosophy that imbues the West today. And it's a moral philosophy that needs to be rejected. And there is no moral thinker that presents an alternative to the Sermon on the Mount other than Ayn Rand. I mean, Aristotle and then Ayn Rand. Spinoza maybe a little bit in between. But there is no alternative in the world today other than Rand's to the idea of sacrifice. Ayn Rand presents a moral theory. Not just a little bit here and there, but a moral theory for living life. A moral theory for living life for oneself. Because who else should you live it for? It doesn't mean you treat other people like garbage. Other people are huge value to you. But it means that your standard by which you make decisions is your own life. Is your own flourishing. Is your own value. It means that each one of us as individuals needs to strive to be the best that we can be as individuals, as human beings as complete human beings, as reasoning animals, as rational animals. This small code, I think, is, you know, since I don't really understand epistemology that much, this to me is what the heart of what Ayn Rand's ideas are. This to me is why I fell in love with Ayn Rand. I fell in love with Ayn Rand because 
for the first time, somebody said to me, it's okay to live for you, for yourself. It's okay to aspire, to be happy. It's okay to live a complete and fulfilling life. The moral ideal is not Christ on a cross dying a painful, excruciating death for sins he did not commit, for sins other people committed. I can't think of anything more unjust than putting Jesus on the cross. <coughs> no. Life is to be enjoyed. Life is to be embraced. Life is to be lived fully. That's Ayn Rand's morality, you know, in a, in a superficial, quick way. Right? I encourage you all to read The Virtue of Selfishness. Uh, her book, is it in French? Mm -hmm. Which is in French. Um, because I think that's a, a, a revelation. Now, all of the morality is in Atlas Shrugged. Because Fine Rand, the moral ideal is not Christ on a cross. It's John Galt. It's the man who felt no guilt, no unearned guilt, no original sin. The man who lives, lives for himself, asks no other man to live for him, but will not live for anybody else but for himself for the fulfillment of his own values at nobody's expense, but as a trader in win-win relationships with other human beings, with other people. So these, to me, are the foundational ideas. These two ideas of reason and individualism are the foundational ideas of Ayn Rand's philosophy. I believe she completes the Enlightenment project, or at least add significantly to it for us maybe to fully complete to the extent that there's still philosophical work to fill in the defense of reason and defense of individualism but Ayn Rand takes us a long way Ayn Rand is primarily a philosopher primarily has something to say about reason and individualism or egoism capitalism as a political and economic system I think are outcomes of that if you are an individualist, that is, you care about your own life, and you are capable of knowing the world through your reason, you don't need mother government sitting on your shoulder telling you how much to pay your employees or how much to take as an employee, what soda you're allowed to drink and what food you're not allowed to drink, what drugs you're allowed to consume and what drugs you're not. I'm talking about the, the, the healthy ones, but you know, anyway, you, you, you know, it's none of anybody's business. And if you are a real individualist, if you're an egoist, you don't want anybody telling you what to do. You want to discover truth by yourself. You want to go out there and try and experiment and learn and fail and succeed and learn from your failures and move in life. You don't need government regulations and controls. And you certainly don't want government taking 50% of your money, which represents 50% of your time, which represents 50% of your life. It's yours. Because you're an egoist and you care about what your stuff is. Put aside all the economic theory and all that. At the end of the day, that's not what's important. I mean, it's all consistent, right? But at the end of the day, it's not about maximizing some utility function or maximizing the GDP of France. Who cares? It's about maximizing my freedom to live as I see fit. So that I can pursue the values necessary for my life for my happiness and yeah it turns out that GDP is maximized when you do that but that's not a starting point and it's not this is the big difference objectivists have with libertarians we don't start with economics we end with economics we end with politics we don't start there we start with reason and individualism we start with the foundation the philosophical foundations I believe of liberty I believe of the enlightenment of any successful society so, France needs Ayn Rand because the whole of Western civilization needs Ayn Rand because we're in decline. These ideas are under attack. Ayn Rand has the best answers out there for the attack. She is the best defense of Western civilization, civilization that exists in the world today. The rise of collectivism, the rise of tribalism, the rise of emotionalism can only be dealt with through philosophy, through a philosophical attack on them. And Ayn Rand gives us the best tools to do that. 
But more than that, and I'll just end with this note, the most important thing, in my view, about Ayn Rand's philosophy is not what it does for France, it's not what it does for Western civilization, it's not what it does for any country or place or anything like that. It's what it can do for you as an individual and what it can do for them as individuals out there. At the end of the day, a life of unreason, a life filled with unearned guilt, a life filled with collectivistic ideas that you don't actually live or some people do live but, but that, that are constantly tugging at you is an unhappy, miserable, pathetic life. It's a life filled with angst, with anxiety. Ayn Rand is the ultimate self-help. Ayn Rand is the ultimate philosophy for living a life free of unearned guilt, a life that is, makes possible, makes the, it possible to flourish and to be truly happy, to truly achieve happiness in life. So at the end of the day, it's the individuals who need Ayn Rand more than it is any civilization or any country or anything like that, because Ayn Rand is primarily a philosopher of and for the individual. Thank you. Sorry for everyone. Um, <laughs> the accent is kind of cute. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Have you read uh, the biography uh, by Alain Laurent of Iran? And if no, I, I explain why. I have not. Uh, I have not. I asked the question because um, uh, if you are French, um, there is not a lot of book translated in French about Ayn, Ayn Rand. Sure. You have some of her novels, and maybe the only one book about Ayn Rand is uh, Alain Laurent's book. And uh, in the last two chapters, and Alain Laurent will correct me if I say something wrong, uh, what you learn about Ayn Rand, that she's not a real philosopher, that she has never read Kant or Nietzsche or Plato, and um, that the influence of Aristotle is maybe a fraud um, and all stuff like that and stuff like that and about her personality that it, she's like almost hysterical or some stuff like that and this is the image the only image you can have in French when you read so I um, agree with all these statements that I don't know what in his book so I am respectfully going to disagree um, uh, certainly she read Kant, certainly she read all of those philosophers. I don't think there's any evidence she didn't read them. And there is evidence she did. Evidence of people who knew her personally and who, you know, who knew philosophy because they studied it. They got PhDs in philosophy and who had conversations with her directly. Uh, so I disagree with that. I disagree with the idea of, of you know, I don't understand, I guess, the idea of, of, uh, of uh, uh, Aristotle's influence as a fraud. Um, she had a temperament. She, she was a passionate person. Uh, I think most geniuses are. Um, I, I don't think she was, uh, I, I, I don't make a big deal out of that. I don't think it's, it's that significant. She had a temper, yeah. When she saw an injustice, she saw something wrong, she had a temper. She certainly didn't like certain people. And she let you know when she didn't like them. But I don't know, I mean, I have not seen anybody say Ayn Rand's wrong about Kant. Here's the reference. What she said about Kant, and again, verified by philosophers who studied with her and studied philosophy as well, um, I, I think uh -huh. is legitimate. I, you know, I also don't buy this notion, and I, and I know a lot of the biographies, even in English, present this, of her being miserable and, and uh, depressed and, and so on. I, 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 again, based on people who knew her, I, I just don't think that's true. Again, was she angry? Sure. Was she depressed when Atlas Shrugged didn't succeed the way she thought it would succeed? The people didn't respond to it the way she thought? Yeah. But she got back on her feet and started writing nonfiction, right? And she spent all the 60s and 70s writing and working. And to the, and, and to the day she died, she was working. You know, on the week that she died, she was still writing 
She was writing a, 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 a television adaptation of, uh, of Atlas Shrugged. Um, from what I know, she was a happy person. She was a difficult person. Uh, she was a principled person. She was a passionate person. But she was not a miserable or depressed or, 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 or nasty person as so many of other people's biographies. Again, I haven't read Alon, so I can't comment, but other people's biographies have presented her as. And I'm hoping there'll be a definitive biography coming out uh, which, which will document what courses she took in college, what books she read. I mean, part of the thing is you can go to her library. We have the library in the Ayn Rand archives. And you can see the books she read, and you can see her annotations on the books. Yes, but most French no, I know. speak I know. only in French, and they have the only book. I suggest. And even in English, the, the these views are. The two last chapters, because it's very yeah. uh, interesting the image that we can have in France. And also the fact that uh, Alain Laurent just said that uh, we have the virtue of selfishness in French. Uh, it's important to precise that it's just some chapter, just seven chapter on the uh, 19 chapter. Yep. It, it, does it have the main essay, the objectivist ethics? Yes. Good. Well, that's the most important one. Did you want to comment? I would just, uh, I would just um, encourage you to make your own judgment. At the end of the day, uh, you have to judge for yourself. And I encourage you to the extent you can read in English. But what's available in French is great. And then, and then, you know, read the rest in English because there's a lot to read. And there's a new book that came out called The Companion, uh, Companions Ayn Rand's, uh, Ayn Rand's Ideas. It just came out about a year ago uh, by a number of scholars. Well, that's 100 voices. But, but the real, this is good for, the this is good for her personality I, I, and for her life. It's 100 different interviews with 100 different people who knew her. But I think for the philosophy, The Companions Ayn Rand is written by philosophers, each one writing an essay from a different perspective on her philosophy and explaining it, but also analyzing it. Uh, so I, I, I think it's the most valuable book out there written by, uh, about her, um, available today. I also recommend Leonard Peikoff's philosophy, Objectivism to Philosophy of Ayn Rand, which I think is the definitive philosophical statement of her ideas, integrated into one book. Yeah, and I, it might be out there. But, but there Any other questions? Yeah. yeah thanks for your uh, speech. Um, in the light of what you said about uh, the embedded uh, Christianity uh, in all of us and uh, the attacks on reason, it made me uh, think about uh, my, uh, my becoming a libertarian. Uh, two things uh, come to mind after what you said. It's when I uh, discovered uh, uh, Pyrrhonism. It's like uh, discrediting pseudo-medicines and uh, things like that, and uh, arguing about uh, the reason in medicine and in medical uh, things. So uh, that was uh, one of the first things in my life that, is, uh, that, that was... Uh, defined reason for me. And the second thing was when I became an atheist. I was a, a hardcore, passionate believer. I wanted to be a priest at one point. And then uh, I flipped uh, totally and I became a hardcore atheist because I read something that... Uh, and uh, these two transformations, I think, paved the way uh, to my becoming a libertarian that came a few years after. And uh, when I, uh, when I uh, recall these moments, uh, it was incredible because my brain was uh, actually, I felt my brain really working without anchor. Uh, I was like lighter and uh, free and happy. And that's, uh, I think that's why it's paved the way to my becoming. Yeah, that's happy. a great story. And, I, and I, think that's, I think you've identified something important, really, really important. Now, there'll be a lot of people who tell you, a lot of libertarians are Christians or Jews or Muslims or whatever. So, and I get into trouble all over the world. Um, and and uh, uh, because I, you know, a, a lot of the lead thinkers today in the libertarian world are Christians, but I'm not a libertarian in that sense. I'm, I'm an objectivist, and uh, you know, I, I, I share certain uh, political principles with libertarians, but I don't believe in a big tent, and I think we are doomed to lose the case for freedom if we anchor it in religion. Religion is mysticism. Religion is Christian ethics. And the Christian ethics and mysticism are incompatible with freedom. Never mind libertarianism. They're incompatible with freedom. This is why when any civilization, any civilization at any point in human history that has taken religion seriously and given religious authorities political power has always been authoritarian. Whether it's Old Testament Jews or, 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 or whether it's the, the communities of Hasidic Jews, which are basically authoritarian in their little communes, 
or whether it's uh, uh, post Roman Empire or during Roman Empire Christianity, once it became political, uh, whether it's the Catholic Church, uh, to some extent to this day, uh, or whether it's or whether it's Calvin and, and Calvin's uh, Geneva, they were dictatorships, and they have to be dictatorships. There is no other way to to to, to handle it. So. Now again, I get into trouble with this, so uh, my religious libertarian friends will, will come and talk to you, I'm sure. Um, but I don't, I, I think those two are incompatible, and I, I, at Mont Pelerin, I don't know if you're familiar with Mont Pelerin Society, at the last big meeting of the Mont Pelerin Society, Classical Liberal Society, uh, they had a debate between me and, and a, a Catholic, the moderator was a Catholic priest, so uh, it was two against one, uh, about whether religion is compatible with freedom or not, and I, I strongly took the stand that it's not. And, and uh, I, in that sense, I think Europe has an advantage over America because I think America has this two religion is way too embedded. Not that Americans take the religion really seriously, but it, the more seriously they take it, the more we move away from freedom. The rise of evangelical Christianity has brought about the destruction of the Republican Party and the move away from freedom. And it's no accident the evangelicals, uh, and, and I don't know what Ellen said about Donald Trump, but, but I, I view Donald Trump as a big step backwards, uh, uh, away from freedom. Uh, and it's no accident the evangelicals supported Trump. They, they support uh, uh, an element, the element of authoritarianism in Trump. Christopher Hitchens and Richard Dawkins, your bigger reader? Or? Well, the problem with Christopher Hitchens and Dawkins, as much as I respect their views on atheism, is that they are Christians when it comes to morality. So they have internalized Christian morality and adopted it and secularized it and accepted. And as a consequence of accepting that morality, they have accepted socialism, basically. So they've accepted statism. But it's not that they start with statism. They start with morality. They start with the idea that the individual doesn't matter. And Dawkins even has a genetic theory about why the collective matters and altruism is genetically coded and all, the, all this nonsense. So, so he starts with the, with the morality and then derives his socialism from that. Unfortunately, uh, you know, Sam Harris is tinged with the same thing, although I think Sam Harris is better than, than Dawkins and uh, Hitchens. Although, you know, you got to love some Hitchens sometimes when he, you know, when he goes after certain groups. He, he can be incredibly articulate and amazing. And, da and, and, and Hitchens, I, give, I, res I respect this about Hitchens. Hitchens is one of the few contemporary intellectuals who realized that Ayn Rand was the enemy and spent significant amounts of time in his talks attacking her. And I respect that. Most of them just ignore her. So, yeah. you had a question? Yeah. Yes. Uh, you mentioned the case of Scandinavia. Um, I have a friend, a socialist friend, who is very passionate and stubborn about it. I've been trying to convince him that it wasn't real, really socialism, that yeah. it wasn't that effective, but it's not working. So, what do you think I should tell him? Well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure you can tell him anything that'll work. But but I do have I do have a, a, at least one video and maybe a couple of podcasts just on Scandinavia. So there's there's a lot of content up. But just a quick outline: Scandinavia, Sweden in particular, from 1870 until 1955, 60, was the most capitalist country in Europe, and maybe in the world. And certainly, uh, and, and as a consequence, went from being the poorest country in Europe in 1870 to the richest country in Europe in the early years after World War II. Partially, it was the richest because World, World War II had destroyed the rest of Europe and Sweden remained relatively unscathed. But also, before World War II, it was a very rich country. Many of the biggest industries in Europe were based in Sweden as a consequence of the freedom that was allowed. In 1960, they decided to, to, to go to socialism. They took all their wealth that they had built up over you know, 90 years or so and started redistributing it. And they redistributed and redistributed it, became poorer and poorer and poorer. Until in 1979, what was the largest income-producing industry in uh, Sweden? ABBA. ABBA, the rock group. Number two, Johan Borg, the tennis player. So industry was gone. Big business was gone out of Sweden uh, because they, 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 it was too regulated, it was too taxes, too much. And then by 1994, Sweden was Greece of today. Sweden was bankrupt. Sweden couldn't pay their debts. And since 1994, the government of Sweden has been reducing government spending, reducing redistribution of wealth, and dramatically reducing regulation. So indeed, Sweden today is less regulated business-wise than America is, than the United States of America is. And uh, so Sweden today 
is not more socialist in any significant way than the United States of America is. It's just got a different set of mixed economy. All economies in the West are mixed. Some with more statism and less freedom, some with more freedom and less statism, but they're all mixed. And most of them are mixed about the same place, right? We, we all you know, tend to spend on a total about between 40 to 60% of GDP. We're right in the middle. The United States is closer to 40. If you add up federal, state, and local governments, it's close to 40. Uh, Sweden is like close to 50. I don't know where France is. I think it's closer to 60, France. Yeah. So they're all, but they're all between 40 and 60, right? So, I mean, they're all statist. They're all government run, basically. You know, gone are the days where the federal government in the United States in the 19th century spent 3.5% of GDP. Today, the federal government spends 20%. 3.5%. You could cut government spending at the federal level by 80% and give back to the wonderful, in my view, economy of the 19th century. So, I mean, that's just the beginning. But you could go on in detail about the fact that Swe Swedes are always happy. When you survey Swedes, they're happy, right? And also happiness studies, Swedes are very happy. Because when you go to Sweden and you ask Swedes, are you happy? You're supposed to say yes. You know, I'm Jewish in origin, right? When you ask a Jew if you're happy, nobody says yes. It's like it goes against everything you believe in to say yes. You're happy? How can you be happy? Look at all the problems in life and everything. Um, so these studies are silly. Uh, and uh, by the way, Swedes in America are just as happy as Swedes in Sweden. Swedes in America live longer or just as long as Swedes in Sweden. Swedes in America live in bigger houses, drive bigger cars, have more wealth than Swedes in Sweden. So when you control for variables, suddenly you discover that all the Sweden is good effects go away. They go away. Now there's a selection bias, you could argue, because the best Swedes went to America. <laughs> yes. Nowadays, what's the status of the works of Nathaniel Brandon at the Ayn Rand Institute? Uh, are his works uh, promoted or ignored or criticized? Uh, I'm asking this question because I'm a big fan of Ayn sure, Rand, sure. and at the same time, I like his works. I read his uh, autobiography, uh, the psychology of self-esteem, yeah. the psychology of romantic love, which I found really interesting. I know that he was very criticized when he broke up with Ayn Rand yeah. by his uh, by Ayn Rand's friends. So, what do you think about him? Uh, so, so he is cited, and his works are promoted from the period where he worked with Ayn Rand. So from uh, the Psychology of Self-Esteem, which, which she helped him, she edited it, but was published after they split, but she was involved in writing it, all through all the books of essays, uh, Virtue of Selfishness, Capitalism, and all have essays by Nathaniel Brandon, and included in it, and she wanted them to stay in the books and to continue to be promoted, uh, uh, the existing work. We do not promote the work that he did after, uh, for a couple of reasons. One is, I mean, I don't want to get into a big debate about this, but I consider him a bad guy. He might have been a good psychologist, he might, but I consider him a bad human being. I think he did significant damage to the objectivist movement. I think he led the objectivist movement, unfortunately under Ayn Rand's guidance, in a negative direction. He was dogmatic. He was a nasty person. He treated people. I mean, he writes about psychology, but it's weird how people who write about psychology tend to be angry nasty people. But he was a nasty person. He treated people on a one-on-one -on -one basis in a horrible way. Um, uh, so, you know, so we don't promote him after that because we, we don't want to promote a guy who, who we consider a bad person. Um, I do think his works written right after the split with Ayn Rand, particularly the uh, Psychology of Romantic Love, I, I, I think are good. So there's, there's good work. I think the more further away from Ayn Rand he got, the worse he got. And he started dabbling in mysticism and in men's rights and drum, all kinds of weird things. Later on in life, he, he did seances, he, all kinds of strange stuff. Um, so that is later in life, uh, I think in the late 70s and, and going into the 80s. Uh, so I'd say the early work is best work and, and, uh, and is good. Uh, and, and I'm sure that in the future, objectivist psychologists, psychologists who, who study Ayn Rand will also study his work and, and refer to it. I'm not a psychologist, I'm, a, I'm not a philosopher, I'm an economist, right, I'm a finance guy. Is there any other famous uh, Randian psychologist? Uh, Unfortunately, no, although I think 
that she and Nathaniel Brandon had a significant influence on psychology, the whole rise today of the, of the cognitive psychology movement, and even elements within the positive thinking movement, although I think some of that's primacy of consciousness, but the whole idea of, of cognitive psychology, the idea that emotions are derived from ideas and what we think and the conclusions we come to, all of that comes from the work of Ayn Rand and comes from the work of Nathaniel Brandon. So I think she's had a profound impact on the field of psychology, even though I can't say that this particular psychologist read Ayn Rand and, and what the links are. But you can see that the whole discussion of self-esteem really starts, I mean, in, in, with, with Ayn Rand, and Ayn Rand makes it a, a cardinal value, right? It's one of the three cardinal values, self-esteem. And, and self-esteem was not a psychological term until really the 1960s, until Nathaniel Brandon, Ayn Rand, and then Nathaniel Brandon bring it in. And then it becomes, and then it gets distorted, and today it's, it, it's, it's nonsense. But at least the discussion of the concept was, was Ayn Rand. I, I, I mean, I'll say this just generally. I believe Ayn Rand's had a profound impact on the culture already. I think concepts like self-esteem, concepts like capitalism. Capitalism in the 50s and 60s was a dirty word. And the only two people who spoke up for capitalism in a popular way, in a way that affected the culture, are Ayn Rand and Milton Friedman. And by the 1980, capitalism is okay word. By the time Reagan and Thatcher are elected, they can talk about capitalism. That's because of the work Ayn Rand. So I think in many ways, subtle ways, not embracing the entire philosophy, Ayn Rand has already had a substantial impact. There's good evidence to suggest that the draft was eliminated in the United States because of people who associate with Ayn Rand and who brought her ideas in front of Nixon and got rid of the draft, an important pro-liberty moment. So there's a lot of things I think that have happened. We tend to be too pessimistic about the influence. Yeah, in the back. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, what was the core of your talk, I think, was this idea of uh, Renaissance and Enlightenment not being achieved. And fully, also, fully manifest, yeah. Yeah, and being under attack. Yeah. Um, I agree with this idea, and I'm questioning the why. And you say that what is under attack is individualism and rationalism. And my personal feeling is that at some point in the process of enlightenment, there was an idea which was really in the core of the writings at that, at that time was res publica. Res publica. No? No. Translate, somebody? Okay. Uh, in Latin, res is the thing, publica is the common thing. Yeah. Okay? Okay. So yeah. this is the, 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 the origin of republic. Yes. Res publica. Yeah. In Many, one. Okay? Yes. So it's the idea of general interest as a goal. Yes. And the only non negotiable thing being the world being governed for the general interest. Yes. And at some point, at least in France, we stopped making any distinction between res publica and demos kratos. Yes. Democracy. Yeah. Okay? Mm -hmm. Which is absolutely not the same. Res publica was a goal to achieve, a focus point. It requires an analysis. It requires rationalism. Maybe it requires, as a step, uh, to think individualism as well. But once you start confusing res publica and demos kratos, demos kratos, what is it? What is democracy? Democracy. The rule of the mob. It's. But it's not an objective, it's a methodology. So as soon as you start confusing the, the objective, the site, <coughs> the focus point, and a methodology, an idea of methodology, you're losing your way. And then you cannot achieve enlightenment. That's what my, it's not a question, it's something I share with you to have your opinion on that. And we do, do, we do not have a system, we have a religion. Because democracy is a religion with, with its own kind of Bible, which is human rights. So as soon as you are in a religion with a Bible, you're not in uh, analysis, individualism, uh, uh, science. You're in believing. Yes. That's why I want to suggest. I think we do not achieve So I agree with you. <laughs> I agree with you. But I would suggest that the points I made are more fundamental. That what you're identifying, which is true, 
is the consequence of abandoning reason and abandoning individualism. The, the consequence of abandoning those things, we abandon the idea of a republic and the, the meaning of laws and the meaning of the rule of law. And we embraced, because we, we lost what that means, because we lost, I think we lost the concept of individual rights as Locke understood it. We, we, we lost that. And maybe France never had it, right? I mean, there's a possibility France never had it completely. And, and Britain ultimately, you know, Bentham says individual rights are nonsense on stilts, right? Super nonsense. So already in the 19th century, they're chipping away at the idea of individual rights. Um, I think once you lose that, then what's left, right? What's left is whatever the majority wants. And what does the majority want? Whatever they feel. And that's emotion, and that's the loss of individuals. And in, in, uh, the whole idea of an inalienable individual rights is the idea that the majority can't take it away from you. And that's what the American Republic is built on, is the idea of the individual sovereignty, and that the government is not there to... Uh, you see, and, and, and this is partially uh, the understanding of republic, common good. I think, I think there is no such thing as the common good. All there is is the good of the individual. What, what is in the common good, in the proper sense, is to protect the individual. And not to think, oh, when we aggregate individuals, what, what good do we get? That thinking is a wrong thing. It's, it leads to collectivism and leads ultimately to democracy. So I think even, even the concept of republic was perverted. Yeah, that's why as soon as we stop thinking in terms of Respublica and republic, but you see, I think we stop thinking in terms of individuals and in terms of reason, yes. and then as a consequence, we stop thinking in terms of republic. Yes, if you, if you lose the word, you lose the idea, instead of that word, instead of the idea, you replace it by, by an idea which yes. is collectivism, yes. which is democracy is nothing else, yeah. then you lose the, the way, and you cannot achieve this uh, enlightenment process. I agree with you, and I agree with your, your characterization of democracy as a religion. I think it, 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 it certainly is today. I mean, you can say, you, you can, I mean, you can criticize almost anything today, but if you criticize democracy, people flip out. They think you're the devil, and, and it's, it's the worst thing in the world, and they don't realize there's an alternative. They think democracy, authoritarianism. Th th those are the options. And they don't realize there's a third alternative. And then do not realize that there are countries in the world, or organization, where you are pursuing general interests that are not democracies. Yes. Like Singapore, or like the family. Yeah, a family is not a democracy. Or a corporation, a corporation or many other. For, for Iran, what is uh, moral or, or not? I mean, uh, yeah. how do you uh, test, uh, Iran test, to decide what is moral or, or not? The moral is that which supports human life, which that is good for human life. The immoral is that which threatens human life. It's that which is bad for human life. And then she says, now it's a scientific question. Let's look at the world and see what things support human life and what things threaten human life. And, and if you read uh, the objectivist ethics and the virtue of selfishness, and, and it's in, uh, that essay is in French in, in the book, it's in, she then articulates, well, what she thinks is the most important thing that supports human life. And for her, the most important thing that supports human life is to use your mind, is to think that all human values are the creation of human thought, of human reason, everything. And therefore, to her, the number one value, the thing to act to gain or keep, the thing you want is reason, and the number one virtue, the action to take, is to be rational. And then she articulates a whole system of what she believes are the principles that are consistent with life, are consistent with success in life, and those which are consistent with failure. Those would be vices, failure is vices, and those who are successful uh, are, uh, are virtues. So to her, it's a science. What's good for human life? Just like nutrition, right? A doctor in nutrition says, these foods are good for you, these foods are bad for you. And it's hard to tell. And nutritionists disagree. But they agree on the standard. All nutritionists agree that the standard is human health. The difference is that in ethics we don't agree. Some people think the standard should be other people. And Ayn Rand says the standard should be you. Your well-being as a human being. Now, 
We can have different philosophers disagree about what constitutes human well-being. Aristotle and Ayn Rand would disagree about what constitutes human well-being. But the standard of virtue, the standard of morality, is your well-being, your life, your survival, your ability to, to flourish as a human being in life. Thanks. Feel free to jump in, Alin. Uh, I have a question. It may sound stupid, but I like sure. you too. <laughs> <laughs> you won't be the first one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I would like you to explain uh, the, the Trump paradox because uh, he says to be very influenced by Ayn Rand uh, and he, he seems to be very well, collectivist of the yeah. Rand, so yeah. how does you S explain this paradox? Sure. So there is n there's nowhere where Trump claims to be influenced by Ayn Rand. There's not a single place where he claims that. What he said, the only quote I know that he mentions Ayn Rand, he said that Fountainhead was one of his favorite novels. So what? Right? Victor, uh, you know, Les Miserables or, or 93 is one of my, uh, are my favorite novels. Doesn't mean I agree with Hugo about everything. And doesn't, agree, you know, Hugo is a socialist. I'm not a socialist, but I love his novels. So uh, Trump read Fountainhead. Maybe it's because it's about ac ar architecture and he's a developer. Who knows what he got out of it? I mean, I have a very low view of Trump. I don't think he's very smart. And I, 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 I doubt that he finished the Fountainhead, and I really doubt he understood it, philosophically. <laughs> I, I think very few people understand the Fountainhead, and I, I certainly don't think Trump is one of them. Nothing he says, no policy he holds, no belief that he has is consistent with Ayn Rand. Mm -hmm. he, he generally wants to deregulate the economy, fine, but he doesn't really. He, wants, he, he doesn't know what he wants. He has no philosophy, he has no ideas, he has no beliefs, he has no system. So he, he absorbs. You know, somebody said, somebody um, did a little research project and how he came up with draining the swamp. Somebody suggested, you know, draining the swamp sounds good. Trump said, yeah, let me try that. And he went on a speech and he said, drain the swamp. And everybody went, yeah, we want to drain the swamp. And he said, okay, that works. I'm going to keep saying it, right? He is a marketer. He is good at marketing. He has his name on all his hotels, Trump everywhere. He is good at marketing. And that's what he did. He looked at the election and he said, what can I say that will get people to vote for me? Does mm -hmm. Trump really believe trade is bad? I don't know. I don't think he cares. But he knows that at this moment in history, Americans are, are suspicious, are anxious, are afraid of China and of trade. So he goes after trade. Does he really hate immigrants? His wife is an immigrant. He's married to an immigrant. But everything he does suggests he hates immigrants. No. Again, there's a moment in American history right now. Sad. All these are sad, right? I'm, I'm not... Where people hate immigrants. Not just illegal ones. They, they say they hate illegal immigrants, and they love legal immigrants. But when you push them, they hate immigrants, period. So he capitalized on that, and he used that as a marketing campaign. He saw that before everybody else, that there's a real frustration and anger in America and that these are ways to, and, and look, he acted, and, and if you, again, I, 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 I've done some podcasts on this and where I really analyzed Trump, but he acted like an authoritarian. This is, this is what authoritarians do. Step one, tell people the world is ending, it's falling apart, they should be really, really afraid. Right? Easy because there's some element of truth, but exaggerated, Right? Uh, he would say there's carnage in the streets of America. You know what carnage is? Really? I mean, not in my streets. I mean, if you look at crime statistics in America, there are some, we, we live in some, one of the most peaceful periods in all of American history. Uh, crime is up a little bit uh, significantly in Chicago. Uh, uh, crime. But that's it. In, you know where I live? There's... For all intents and purposes, there's no crime. I remember in, in the 70s and 80s going to New York City and being afraid to leave my hotel at night. Today, you can walk in the streets of New York City at 2 a.m. Nobody's afraid. And yet, this, you know, carnage in the streets. So we start, oh, and you're losing your jobs. Everybody's losing. The factories are empty all over America. Really? Unemployment is 4%, which is not bad, you know. Um, 
it, we produce in America more stuff than ever in history. Double what we produced when people, when, when the maximum amount of people work in production. We have less people working, we produce more. Not surprising, technology. But we're more producing more stuff, more real things than ever in American history. But oh, America's producing nothing. It's all gone to China. It's nonsense. Every single one of these things he said to scare us has an element of truth which he blows up out of proportion. Mm -hmm. So part one, you scare people. Part two, who do you blame? It's not your fault. No, Americans are good people, hardworking people. They believe in God and country and everything's going to be fine. Right? Whose fault is it? It's the other. Fill in the blank. If you're a European authoritarian, it's Jews. Or maybe today it's Muslims. Right? Again, element of truth, but blown out of all proportion. Right? It's Jews. Now, in America, you can't say that, particularly if you want to win an election. <laughs> so you say it's the Chinese. It's the Mexicans. It's the South Koreans. It's the Germans. It's anybody we trade with. And, of course, it's immigrants because they are the ultimate other. Right? They're closer to being the Jews of, of Europe because right? they're in your country and they look different. Oh, my God. Right? So it's immigrants and it's and it's 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 foreigners, and then you and then how do you solve the problem? Right? There's a problem. Life is terrible. It's other people's fault, not Americans. How do you solve the problem? You build a wall. And the ultimate authoritarian, trust me, I ran a business. I know how to fix things. Don't worry. Trust me. That's the playbook of every authoritarian in history. Scare them, blame, find a scapegoat, and then tell them to trust you. And that, that's what Trump did. Is he an authoritarian? No, because the system in America is robust and won't let him be an authoritarian. But is he in his blood an authoritarian? Absolutely. He, he says to the Republicans, do away with the filibuster, right? There's a reason there's a filibuster, because the founders didn't like democracy. So they wanted 60 votes. They didn't want 51 for everything. They wanted people to really believe in something, you know, uh, before they passed the law. Right? So, uh, you know, he wants to undo all that because, because he, he, he doesn't care. He's a pragmatist. He wants to win at any cost. So that's my anal quick analysis of Trump. Yes? Yes. Uh, in your opinion, what, uh, to what extent should the youth of Iran have a Russia, that she lived through the revolution, she came from an upper class family. Uh, middle class, yeah. Middle class, yeah. She, did, she wasn't upper class, she was middle class. She's Jewish, uh, owned a pharmacy, that's not upper class. Um, I, you know, so uh, th this is a question that's, that's broader than I meant. What makes us who we are? Um, the environment in which we were raised, option one. Our genes, option two. And then psychologists say it's a mixture of both. And of course, they ignore option three, which I think is the most important, which is the choices we make, the, the, idea, the, 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 the free will that we all have over our own lives, the, the, the decision and choices we make. And people ignore that completely. It's as if we're automatons dictated by environment and genes, which is ridiculous in my view. And all you have to do to discover how ridiculous it is is look inside yourself, introspect a little bit and you can discover your own will. I think Ayn Rand is mostly the third part, and I think all of us are mostly the third part. I think we are mostly creations of ourselves. I think she was, I mean, 150 million Russians, probably more than that, lived under communism. There's only one Ayn Rand. So 150 million were exposed to those ideas, only one Ayn Rand. Millions and millions and millions lived before Russia with the great 19th century, <laughs> and none of them are Ayn Rand. So she took that. That was all material for her, no question. And she wouldn't have said and been exactly the same person if not for those, right? Her genes, who made her a genius, her environment that gave her the, the information, the evidence. But it's her choices, her particular mind that did what it did with it that came out. She would have come up with this philosophy, I think, even if she wasn't in the Soviet Union, but it would have been different. It would have been... The, focus and the orientation probably would have been somewhat different. 
but she's not a product of, nobody is a product of the environment unless you shut yourself down. If you, close, if you don't think for yourself, then you become a product of other people. She was obviously not that. She, she was an original thinker. Um, so I, I think she, that's part of it. You know, being born at the beginning, beginning of the 20th century or the late 19th century gave you a certain spirit that I don't think being born today you could have. A certain optimism, a certain joie de vie, or I say that right? You know, love of life. A certain, you know, life is good. Pre-World War I, there was this attitude in Europe that just, you know, think about the music. Nobody could write Tchaikovsky or, or Chopin or, or Yuvachman enough today. It's just not in, the, it's not in the psyche. We're cynics. We have punk rock. That's what we love, right? Not me, but, you know, I'm still a romantic. But romantic music is impossible today. Right? I was at the uh, Dosset Museum today, and nobody can sculpt like that. Not because they don't have the technical skills, but nobody believes in that. Nobody believes in human beings being heroic and beautiful and magnificent like they did in the 19th century. We just don't. We think yeah, human beings, scum. So we, 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 we make them into abstractions so we can't, God forbid, identify that there's a human being there. Um, no, this was a beautiful, amazing... I mean, particularly for you French, I mean, God, to be in Paris in the 19th century was culturally, I can't think of another era, maybe other than Greece, of, of cultural vibrancy and, and optimism. And I mean, you, you had Hugo and Liszt and Chopin and, you know, sitting at the coffee shop together. I mean, that just blows your mind, blows my mind, anyway. So... Um, that's, I, I mean, to me, so, so being born during that period matters to your sense of life. I, I think the biggest tragedy we have today is, uh, you know, I know libertarians don't think these ways, but this is how I think, is the lack of that kind of art, that kind of view of the world, that kind of beauty. Again, we got punk rock. That's ugly. I mean, I, 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 whatever you say, you might get into it, but it's ugly. It's not beauty and a heroic man and wonderful, great stuff, right? I don't know, punk rock stuck in my mind, but or the abstract art that we have today, which is mostly ugly and meaningless. It doesn't mean a thing. It's postmodernism on campus, right? No truth, no reality, nothing. That to me, we're poorer in that regard than anything economically. Any the economy, yeah, I could we could still all manage given the socialism that we have. But the lack of great authors, the lack of great novels, the lack of great you know, maybe you have a few decent movies, but even there, right? Luc Besson is <laughs> declining dramatically. There was a question uh, where well, you question, asked. I'm, I'm sorry, but last question. Okay, so but last it, question it was you haven't asked yet. Finished 30 minutes before. Thank you. It was a wonderful speech. Uh, I'm one of the few people here that uh, I'm sure uh, uh, I understand my life, right? But I, have, I want to come back to the concept of free will. Yeah. The whole philosophy, the whole system is based on that. If, yeah. we, will, if we discover that free will doesn't exist, right, the, the whole tower falls apart. Yes. And you mentioned Sam Harris earlier as well. Some what? Sam Harris. Harris. Yes. And you, I'm sure you know that he's not a huge fan of the concept of free will. He's even an advocate of the illusion of free will. He wrote a whole book about that. And the whole field of neurosciences today yeah. is working actively and making progress about the fact that we start to understand the brain better and better. And for now, until now, the evidence seems to suggest that indeed free will is really hard to locate. Yeah. And so, again, I'm a huge fan of Ayn Rand and her philosophy. But if it appears that free will is indeed... Then who cares? I agree with, uh, then, then who cares? Then this discussion is meaningless. Then why am I here? then it doesn't, nothing I say matters. I mean, to me, the idea we don't have free will is, is, a, is so bizarre. It's so ridiculous. And, and with all due respect to the scientific information, we're still at the very, very beginning of understanding how the mind works. To make declaratory statements based on research that suggest that they see something happen before you raise your arm or all this stuff that I read about is, is absurd. It's ridiculous. Um, we, we're at the beginning of the science. There's still a hundred years before we fully understand what, how the mind works, at least. Uh, newer, new, newer scientists that I talk to who are familiar with philosophy say that the science has almost nothing to say about free will. Do you have some books you recommend that would be I, I, 
not anything I could do off the head. If you send me an email, I could, I could, I could ask around. I'm not an expert. But to me, it's ridiculous. Science will never tell us that we don't have free will. Let me make that clear. Science will never tell us that we don't have free will any more than science can tell us that reality doesn't exist. That's the level at which free will is at. Maybe it depends on how you define free will because it's a difficult concept. It's a difficult concept. So Ayn Rand defined free will as the, as the ability. It's the choice to focus your mind, to be in focus, to, to, to initiate contact with the world. Or to not, right? Focus or not to focus. It's not about whether I raise my hand right now or not. It's primarily about the issue of are you in focus or are you not? Are, are you activating your mind or are you not activating your mind? And you, something, is activating that mind that is not, um, that is not, uh, what do you call it, billiard ball causality related. And she defined causality different than David Hume defined causality. She defined causality as the thing acting based upon its nature, not the thing acting because something else acted on it. And the nature of consciousness, of human consciousness, is to have free will. It acts based on its, on its nature. And you cannot undo a philosophical concept like that with science. Science ultimately will tell us how it all works once free will is there. But it won't explain. It, it, it won't explain away. It cannot explain away free will. Any way, any, any different than science can explain away reality. Science will never explain away the existence of this glass. No, we accept that. But because I see it, that's why it can't explain. Because I see it. It's right here. I see it. There's no question. You can see your free will. There's nothing special about your senses that your introspection doesn't have. I know, I, you know, quantum physics has not made me change my mind about this glass. No science that you come up with will make me question the existence, because I see it, of my free will. I know that I'm choosing to be here in the sense of to, to be engaged. Right? And I know that. And that's knowledge, the same kind of knowledge that seeing this glass is. It's the same philosophically, epistemologically. Those are the same types of knowledge. The problem with science, the scientists today, not the problem with science, is that they, 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 they have a corrupt philosophical understanding of these, these concepts, and therefore undermining, uh, you know, the science, the, the philosophy is undermining the real science. What they're discovering is not correlated with what they think they're discovering, philosophically. It's the same problem I think they have with quantum mechanics. Uh, quantum mechanics is an observable reality. This, this, what's going on there is real, but how you interpret it that's a question of philosophy of science. How you interpret the, 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 the results, the neuro, neurological results, is a question for philosophy of science. And, and the question of whether you have free will is not a scientific question. It is a, it is a observational question. It is an axiomatic question. It's something you observe directly, just like this class. It's the best I can do. Not my expertise. Not, you know, I'm not in epistemology. But that's, that's, that, I think that's what Ayn Rand would, would, would say. Thank, Thank you. you.